Hi, and welcome to yet another episode of Casted. This time we're actually uh, sending from Helsinki at a large algorithms conference here in Finland. My guest today is Claire Mathieu. Claire is a director of research in Paris at CNRS. Um, Claire is a heavyweight in algorithms theory, done a lot of work in online algorithms and approximation algorithms. And these are really, really difficult conversations to have, but luckily Claire also likes to get her hands dirty. And uh, so today we will talk about uh, applying one of the famous algorithms in practice. Claire, welcome. Hello, Thor. Um, so what made you enter this particular question of using algorithms in college admissions? A college admission is a big thing in France. There's a centralized system. And last year, the government decided to uh, change the system, update it, starting of essentially from scratch, from the algorithmic perspective. I heard about it uh, from reading about it in the newspapers, and then I contacted the ministry to um, um, express my interest in uh, participating in the design, uh, if possible. Oh, so that's really interesting. So you, you just saw it in the paper and said, I know, I know how to do this better? Or because, because <laughs> no, no, I did not think that. But I do, I do algorithms as my profession. I have worked on algorithms for matching. And I have had an outsider's interest in uh, the kind of algorithms used for college admissions. So I thought I might have something to contribute. Hmm. So, so do we know what happened before you were inserted into this? I mean, there must, be, there must have been a system of college admissions for, what, hundreds of years in France. <laughs> um, college admissions have happened for a long time, and there's been an automated process since uh, basically 2003. You know, there was a very uh, in innovative um, platform in 2003, but then from 2003 to 2018, that's 15 years, it expanded a lot. Uh, many uh, tweaks, many special cases, many rules were added, and it kind of became, um, it needed a, a major overhaul. So let's take a step back. So college admissions is not, is not a French thing, right? This exists in many countries. Yes. And the problem exists uh, basically anywhere where you want to match... Students to universities. Or could be anything else, right? Yes, applicants abstract. to jobs. Um, whenever you have two sides, uh, two kinds of two populations, and they each have uh, certain uh, preferences over the other side. And then you want to match them up. So I guess several hundreds of years ago, college admission would be just a question of being able to afford it or be a member of the nobility. But now, OK, we have so French, uh, so of course it's not that. It used to happen in France is that a student, upon finishing high school, would just send their application to a place he to three places that's what I did when I was a student three places they wanted to go to if they were taken to their top place they were done otherwise the folder was put in the mailbox and mailed to the place number two who would look at the folder and accept or reject and if it was rejected it got put in the mailbox again and sent to the third place okay so from the perspective of the student it's a yes. it's a ranking one two three i prefer to go yes. to this place yes. or to that or to that yes. and if not i would just stay at home and yeah. read poetry something like that and from the perspective of the university the university receives a bunch of applications i guess yes. at the same time there's a deadline um yes there's a deadline the university or the school receives a big collection of applications reads through them decides who to accept, and then sends the others on to the next stage. And then we'll receive some more applications. In the and next if there are any slots left, it might decide to accept some of those new applications for the remaining slots. Mm -hmm. OK, so this mechanism I understand. Yes. So this, in some sense, ensures that certainly for those students who apply to their favorite university, and the university that agrees with that choice, yes. I guess that sort of works for the best, in the best case if, if people... Yes, yes. For example, the, if there's a top student, uh, he, will, he or she will apply to uh, their top choice and they will get in and be done. Good. But uh, there are some complications for students who are uh, perhaps not uh, among the top few. Uh, they they are in a better position if they get examined early on, while there are still plenty of slots. 
mm -hmm. and so it might not be to their advantage to apply to their very, very favorite place if they think they are unlikely to be accepted. You know, then they might think, oh, well, maybe I should skip that because probably they will say no and I should directly apply to my number two choice because that's safer to apply there and get considered while they have lots of slots. Very nice. So already in this very simple example, we have yes. this uh, phenomenon that students may strategically want to misrepresent their choices. That's right. In order to get accepted at, at least at the second best place. Maybe not at the best place, but That's right. instead That's of right. being demoted to the third place. That's right. And this is, I guess, a theme that will recur in our conversation because this is, yes. whenever you design a mechanism like this, these yes. strange incentives appear and you want to avoid yes. them as long as, as far as you can. Yes. Okay. There used so to be a, parents used to have uh, associations that, that used to give advice to students of the form you should apply as number one to the place you really want if it's not so popular. Oh. Or else, mm -hmm. um, if your top choice is popular, you have to be a very strong student. And in any case, in that case, for your number two choice, you should uh, have a really safe choice where you, you feel very confident that they will accept you. Okay, so there was a systematic way to gain the system. Uh, mm -hmm. Sort of, mm -hmm. yes. Some advice are given by associations to try to help students uh, figure out how to order their uh, uh, applications. Mm -hmm. Fine. And then education explodes everywhere and from getting, I don't know, thousands or 10,000 students, suddenly France has, what, close to a million students? Yes. It used to be that uh, of a given uh, uh, population of 18-year-old students, maybe 20% would get a high school degree and move on to a higher education. Mm -hmm. Now it's 90% almost of mm -hmm. the population of 18 year olds who uh, get a high school degree and who, if they want to, are eligible to go to a higher education. So, so the numbers are much, much bigger now. And so because it's close to a million students, the schools have also expanded. Uh, we have um, over 10,000 different types of degrees. And so the numbers are so big that um, you can no longer do it on a one-by-one -one local uh, basis. It has to be some kind of a automated process. Because otherwise it would take months, if not years, for this single <laughs> secretary yes. that I'm envisioning somewhere yes. have, uh, moving that, these files around. Or it would around. be very inefficient. Or it would be, you know, local markets. You know, only the people of this town will go to the university in this town, and then that's it. Right, so by virtue of the problem size increasing, yes. either if you, re if you stay in the old system, there will be uh, corruption or inefficiency or yes. randomness, yes. which can't be good, or you move to a more transparent uh, uh, randomness system. Randomness is not that bad. Randomness is not that bad. No, because if you just assign students at random, then um, you're there's no discrimination. No oh, from fair. a legal point of view, randomness yes. is not that bad. Right. But then you wouldn't need the system anyway, because if we did randomness... Randomness is also not that bad for uh, uh, other perspectives. You know, when, when two applicants are almost equivalent, then uh, you might as well ah. uh, uh, choose at random between them. It's, it doesn't discriminate, and um, it, it's, it's quick. No, it doesn't quick. discriminate as, as, some, as long as the randomness is really random. Random yes. in the sense that you and I use yes. the word uh, it, rather than arbitrary. Maybe, uh, maybe that would be a better word. In, uh, you, you don't want an arbitrary decision. A in, random decision would be nice. A random decision would be nice between equivalent candidates. Mm -hmm. In uh, antiquity, uh, to decide uh, uh, leaders of uh, uh, governance in uh, antique Greece, there were some uh, systems, I think in Athens, where you would pick worthy citizens and then you would draw at random within the set of worthy citizens. Also in the Bible, if you look at uh, Judas, when um, uh, after he was gone to find a replacement apostle among the disciples, two worthy candidates were found and then uh, uh, they drew lots to decide who to uh, select. Mm -hmm. So uh, random again. Uh, it requires the random, random process to be visible and public, of course. Of course. Also, then, in France in the 19th century, people who were uh, drafted to go to do their military service, the ah. length of a military service was 
at least two years, at most seven years, mm -hmm. to decide the duration of the military service. There was a random process. Mm -hmm. One day every year in every town, the mayor would come out, the person, uh, the drummer would come out, all the people would go there, and there would be a draw. Lovely. <laughs> and then people would know how many years they will be gone. Ah, that's a beautiful <laughs> example of a randomized algorithm with a huge effect on it and in, yes. in individuals in a population. Yes. So, um, but for the sake of, of this conversation, let's reject randomness and say that we would prefer a system. Um, randomness was actually decided, ruled as illegal last year oh. by the French government for uh, the specific application of college admissions. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, so having the French government on my side in this, in this thing then, so what do we do instead? Instead, students apply to uh, many colleges, many schools. They send all their applications. There's a platform on which they put their folders, their grades, their uh, recommendation letters. There's a single centralized platform. A single centralized platform by March 31st, they need to have done all their application. Mm -hmm. Then, in April and May, all universities and schools, they look at the people who applied to that place, they look at all the folders, and they rank them. They produce a ranking. Each uh, university by themselves produces a ranking. Each university by themselves um, has a committee that looks oh. at the folders and produces a ranking. Oh, interestingly, so in uh, so the Danish system, which is much smaller yes. because Denmark is much smaller, uh, needs to use the high school. Um, what is this? Um, the grade you get in the end. Yes. So there is a ranking, but the ranking is the same for every. From the perspective of every yes. university, the ranking of the students is the same. We France. We cannot do this because every student gets a grade in the end, the baccalaureate, but this grade is only known when the exam is finished and graded, meaning early July. Oh. And that's too late. Oh. What a wonderful detail. <laughs> okay, good. Back to France. Yes. Mm -hmm. So in April and May, each university takes the applicants and ranks them. This produces a ranking by um, May 20th. The ranking is done. And let's just spell this out. The ranking is based on prior performance in high school, um, it's a sports ability, if it's they sports, have access music to ability. All the information, there's a VIDA, there's a motivation letter, there's grades, there's a, okay. the advice of the teachers. Mm -hmm. So there's an entire folder. And then we don't know what they do with it. We don't know what other information they might use, mm -hmm. but they produce a ranking. Mm -hmm. So this ranking is now known. Now you know uh, how universities rank students. And on May 22nd, the college admissions process starts. Namely, on May 22nd, every university sends offers to the top few students in their ranking. Mm -hmm. For example, they had 3,000 applicants. On May 22nd, they send offers to their top 100 students. And then, the students on May 22nd, some students will get one offer, some will get two, some will get many, some will get zero. The students who receive offers have up to one week to answer. And they have to choose at most one offer among all the ones they received and say yes to that offer and reject all the others. So from the perspective of the student, the student just applied to a number yes. of different uh, yes. universities or degrees, yes. but did not yet rank them in the application process. That's correct. That's correct. I see. So I, as a student, I apply to 10 different uh, educations. Yes. And some of them will offer me a, yes. uh, an, um, a slot. A slot. Excellent word. Yes. And, and as a student, then I make a decision. That's right. Once I get offers, once I have offers in hand, I can decide whether I want to go here or there. Again, for comparison, other systems may actually ask the student to do this ranking beforehand. Yes. This, uh, it was decided this year. This is new as of this year to not ask students for rankings beforehand for several reasons. Um, one reason is that in March, when the students apply, they might not know exactly what their true ranking is, mm -hmm. especially uh, at, at the end of a ranking. 
Um, another reason is that the offers they get sometimes come with strings attached. Like, we admit you to this three-year program, but we think you need additional help, and we will let you do it in four years instead of three years. I Would see, you be I willing see. to come to this place mm -hmm. to get a degree in four years' time? Mm -hmm. So these are conditional offers. Mm -hmm. So the student cannot really know in advance um, how they would like these um, conditional offers. And the third reason is that in the past, the ranking provided by the students, the ranking of schools, was used by the schools to manipulate their own rankings with some uh, unhappy side effects. Oh, so by virtue of the students publishing their own preferences of the universities, the university can now game the system and change the ranking of the students? That was true in previous years. Some oh. universities gave a bonus to applications who put them first in their own, uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, in their preference oh. order. And this um, has a lot of um, um, unpleasant side effect. It encourages students to uh, strategize, not say the truth about their preferences. This year, they don't say anything about their preferences. They don't reveal them. So they're sure that this will not be manipulated since the information is okay. not there. And there's the added bonus of students not having to rank 13,000 different degrees well, by order of preference. They don't apply to 13,000, no. but if they apply to 15, mm -hmm. uh, they don't have to do a provide rank 1 through 15. No. Mm -hmm. Good. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. All right, so we have these 800,000 students applying yes. to tens of thousands of yes. programs. Yes programs send their offers to? To students on May 22nd. Slightly fewer offers than they have slots. Somewhat, yeah, a lot fewer. Um, actually, offers. more offers than they, oh. slightly more offers than they have slots. Mm -hmm. Because. It's like an airplane. What? They, they overbook, I guess. They overbook, yeah. like an airliner. Mm -hmm. They know, well, they know some people won't show up. Yeah. And uh, they know some people will answer no. Uh, they know some of the offers mm -hmm. are long shots. Mm -hmm. Uh, so uh, they make, typically make more offers, substantially more offers than they have slots. Mm -hmm. And then students answer. And then once a student has answered negatively, a uh, university knows a slot has been freed. So this slot is now available to offer to the next student on the list. Right. So they send more offers, then they get more responses. And as long as they're not filled to capacity, they can send more offers. And these rounds take days and days, or weeks and weeks, or how, how quickly is this done now? Um, so the platform runs every night. Every night it's updated, and every morning more offers are sent. Oh. Um, electronically, students, of course, today. Electronically. Mm -hmm. And on the student side, the students have a few days. Uh, there's a deadline. When they have more than one offer, they have a few days to choose between them. I see. So, so, so each French iteration is, I see. Uh, on the university perspective, it's one night to uh, go to the next mm -hmm. uh, phase. Mm -hmm. On a student perspective, it's a, f a few days uh, before they decide and you move on to the next, next iteration. And I guess the university has staff that does exactly this. I mean, there are, um, must be admi admi administrators fact, who make all sure. all handled by the platform. I see. Once the university has ranked its applicants, the university is done. They don't have to oh. um, intervene anymore. Okay. It all happens uh, outside the university on the platform. Mm -hmm. The students, on the other hand, have to be very aware because they have to be reactive. Whenever a new offer arrives, which could be on any day, they have to um, I respond. See. Okay, so I see lots of French high schoolers sitting in cafes in the Latin Quarter with their laptops. Uh, pressing reload to get their uh, college They offers. say it's, it's mm -hmm. been uh, their new uh, hobby this spring. Ah, excellent. Yeah, fine. <laughs> well, it's that or reading poetry. Mm -hmm. Right, mm -hmm. right. Now, there's one important detail that I didn't mention, which is that if a student accepts an offer, imagine a student on the first day gets three proposals. And these are the student's three bottom proposals in his list. Right. Their list that this they have happen, in mind. Yes. OK. So what should they do? Should they say no to all three in the hope of getting something better later, maybe? Should they say yes to the better of the three, but with the risk that maybe later they'll get a better offer? Oh, the reason that the better offers were not offered from the perspective of the student, I get my three worst choices. But of course, 
Somebody okay. else might reject one of my top choices later on. Yes. So I may get that. That's right. So am I now being unstrategic by accepting the best of the three bad choices? So the key, mm -hmm. the key of this algorithm, known as the Gill Shapley algorithm, is that the student can change their mind. They can say yes to the top of the three choices, but then if a week later they get a better offer, they can say, oh, this yes, I've changed my mind. I see. So I, I temporarily accept the offer. Yes become engaged in the yes. original formulation of the Gale Shapley algorithm yes. with, the, with the understanding yes. that I can reject the current proposal and upgrade to a better one. Upgrade, exactly. So all the accepts are tentative. From the perspective of the student? Yes. The university does not get to do this? The university has no choice. Once all of its slots have been accepted, it has to wait. Uh, right. Even though the okay. accepts are tentative, until a student changes their mind. This makes sense. Okay, so, so this is, so the ordering of the, so there are two different strategies involved. There's one strategy is the proposal strategy yes. employed by the universities, yes. which proposes to students. Yes. And the students tentatively accept yes. or reject yes. and possibly trade up. Yes, that's right. And the university, when the university makes an offer, it's a commitment. It cannot right. renege on an offer. When a student accepts an offer, it's tentative, they can uh, upgrade later. Okay, this is completely clear. So, so it's, it's highly unsymmetric. Yes. And uh, yes, yeah, so everybody who teaches this, I actually will be lecturing on this in, in, in two weeks as, as yeah. well, uh, we could just flip this around, right? We could, yes, we could actually, also say that... There is, uh, so this is a graph where you have two uh, parties, students and universities, and I presented the whole thing with universities initiating proposals and students reacting to the proposals, but you could also envision an algorithm that works the other way, where students initiate requests, they send requests to universities, and universities react by saying yes or no, and possibly changing their minds later. This yeah. is what we do for job applications in academia, don't we? Yes, yes, that's right, that's right. That also happens in uh, academia. Yes and many other settings, yes. So, so both algorithms can be defended, the ones where universities propose and the ones where students propose. They both have good uh, um, structural properties and uh, in theory, the student proposing uh, algorithm has one bonus property, which is that a student never, have any, never has any incentive to lie. No. In the algorithm where the student sends proposals. This is this Machiavelli paper. There's an old paper about this, I think. <laughs> right, right, yeah, right. This, yes. yeah, right. There's, this a, is known. The There's student, a known result. Hmm? The student, hmm? um, given the rest, everything else, the student can wonder, should I lie about my preferences, where I'm going to apply? You hmm? know, should I say something different from what I really want? Well, there's no advantage in the student doing this, in the student proposing algorithm. No. So, however, so when you say this, and you can find examples where it, it's not true in the other direction, mm -hmm. so you say, all right, then the student proposing algorithm is better than the other one. But that's theoretical. Now, if you look at reality, if you run uh, these two algorithms on actual real data, what you see is that in practice, these two algorithms give uh, virtually the same result. And you know this by, by having run this? Uh, uh, because we have, we, okay, we have, we have run large this, data sets. We I have see. run this on the data of uh, French uh, colleges and students in the, the 2017 data. And uh, we know uh, the difference is negligible, less than one in 1,000. I see. And you, you ran this by, since you have access to the data, and you wrote a small simulator simulating the... Yes, not me, but my colleague Hugo Jambert mm -hmm. uh, uh, wrote a simulator to try both algorithms. And what he noticed is that, is that these two algorithms are essentially the same. Give well, that's the same very result. interesting. Yeah. Also, in practice, I guess it would be really hard to have switched the roles because then the students would have to daily... Uh, recompute yeah. their offers to universities. It, I guess it's better to have the universities be the uh, In practice, proposing it's, part it's of the It's much system. easier to have universities mm -hmm. be the proposing part. Mm -hmm. It can handle um, uh, changes in the system that happen 
over time. One thing that happens in reality is that you don't have the perfect input initially, then you run things, then you're done, but the, the input, that is uh, the set of students, their preferences, the slots, and capacities of universities, all this evolves over time. So mm. it's much easier to adapt to these things when you have the yeah, university proposing algorithm. Okay, so and now um, it's an easy enough exercise to show that you can even make, I guess, a very simple instance with, I guess I need 13,000 students and 13,001 universities, and there should be an, a very simple setup where this um, process of individual students rejecting the offer and then the university making a new offer to a new student and that student also rejecting his or her original offer, that leads to a cascade of um, uh, reproposals. Yes. That can continue. Yes. And it can continue. Um, and yeah, this yes. is something you prove There's in algorithms big, class. Yeah. This can continue for as many rounds yes. as there are agents in the system. Yes. There's a big downside to the system as I outlined it, which is that if students had expressed their preferences from the start, the algorithm could be all executed on the platform without asking for students' input. They would already have given their input beforehand, and you could be done in one night. Oh, right, right. With, let me just spell this out. This is, this is if every student gives his entire uh, ranking of the universities. Yes. Then we can just run this uh, on the platform yes. in one night and then yes. stop. Yes, we could do it mm? from May 21st to May 22nd. On May 22nd, we'd be uh, sort of done. Yeah. Um, and instead, whenever we have to decide on students' preferences, we ask the students. So the iterations there, there's a number of iterations, and each iteration you have to ask students for feedback, and this is a matter of okay. days. Yeah, it's a very simple algorithm that runs on very, very slow hardware. That's yeah, <laughs> Just one round <laughs> takes a week. Hmm? That's right, mm -hmm. that's right. Mm -hmm. And so then, of course, there's a question that before was not so important, but now becomes critical. How many rounds? How many iterations? How long does it take until convergence? I know this, Professor Mathieu. It's O of n, where n is the number <laughs> of vertices in one of the sites. Yes. Mm -hmm. So in theory, <laughs> you can come up with examples where there's a cascading effect, where mm -hmm. there's a, 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 a student has a choice between two offers. A university gets rejected by the student, makes the offer to a new student who rejects its previous offer from a university who now has a free slot, who gives it to a new student, who rejects their previous offer, and so on and so forth. Everybody gets involved exactly once in this cascade. And each iteration takes mm -hmm. a few days, mm -hmm. and this uh, would take, could take a very, very long time. Fortunately. Like years, Fortunately, like years. Yep. Fortunately, this is theory, and it's not what happens in practice. Because? universities and students have not actually conspired to construct a really, really complicated worst case instance to make this algorithm look bad. That's Instead, right. We don't really have these uh, mm -hmm. cascading effects or when they happen, they are not very long. And so mm -hmm. what we did is we ran some simulations before uh, uh, this going public. We used the 2017 and 2016 data to try to estimate convergence oh. using uh, uh, some assumptions about the student's response time and a variety of assumptions. And what we could see is that this actually converges quickly. That is, within a few iterations. That is, if you start on May 22nd, then by midsummer, um, everybody, more than 99% of the people, more than 99.9% .9 of the people have their uh, final allocation. Except for the one or two computer scientists who, who sneakily <laughs> did exactly the, the ranking to, to, to kill the algorithm. So it takes, what, five rounds or ten rounds or something like that? Um, so a round is not really a week. We shorten the round after a while. And after about, and it's also not oh. only rounds, because each student responds in their own time. Some respond after one day, some respond after three days. So oh, delightfully we, complicated. Yes. We, <laughs> So we shorten the delays as time goes on. It goes more and more quickly. And if everything was parallel, after about 30 mm -hmm. iterations, we'd be a 99% done. You know. And in reality, uh, by now, uh, things uh, seem to have um, stabilized. 
by now and we're having this conversation in the end of August. That's right. That's um, right. School starts in two weeks. Oh, and then the algorithm is done by definition, I guess. Yes. Ah, so the running time is four months, no matter what. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Ah. That's right. And this is the first time this runs? So, so you actually did the tests on last year's data? Yes. And now the Gale Shapley algorithm is running in France? Yes. So the Gale Shapley algorithm was already uh, used before for the past uh, 15 years or so, in 10 France. or 15 years mm -hmm. in France. Um, but it assumed everybody gave their ranking initially. And right. then it ran everything in one night. And then some universities said, actually, we have more capacity than we thought we had. We got more resources from the government. And some students said, actually, I'm not going to take this offer. I'm going to go uh, study abroad. Or I'm going to go uh, take a job. Mm -hmm. So after one night, the platform was done, except not really. And then some students would say, actually, I wrote this was my favorite thing, but not really. I've changed my mind. Or I have a new girlfriend or whatever it is, so, so I'm no longer interested in going to Lyon. Yes, exactly. So the algorithm was nice and quick, but since there are people involved, the yes. result was not as usable. That's right. So there had to be a second round. They said, okay, three weeks afterwards, we'll do a second round where we'll try to incorporate this. Mm -hmm. And then after the second round, oh, well, more things happened. Okay, let's have a third round another, a month later. So, like maybe some students fail to graduate from high school. So this year, what happens is that whenever there's new information, people leave the system or things happen, the following evening, it's incorporated in the system and the next morning, new offers come out as quickly as possible. Okay, it reacts very well to these yes. changing uh, yes. realities, yes. in particular because students don't have to make up their minds among choices before actually seeing them. That's right. That makes a lot of sense to me. So, um, so let's take just one step back. So the algorithm is from the 60s, isn't it? Yes, the 1962, I believe. 62. Yes. Yes. And at least half of them received uh, the Nobel Prize in economics for this, right? <laughs> I, I, it's Shapley um, and Roth, I think. Yes, yeah. that's right. Um, Roth did a lot of work on uh, um, trying to apply these ideas to uh, many different settings. Each setting has a different set of um, uh, <coughs> constraints, side constraints uh -huh. and conditions, depending on the country and uh, the culture. So each of them is actually a lot of work, but variants of the Gill Shipley algorithm have been applied to many situations. And so for that work, together with um, uh, Roth joined uh, in the Nobel Prize. Yes. Also in France, we also have some uh, uh, additional constraints. Yeah, let's uh, get back to them in a, in a second because that's really uh, uh, cool. So, and, and the original motivation was uh, not college admission but matching medical students to hospitals, right? That's right, to um, hospitals where they would do their uh, residency. Um, it used to be that medical students, once they've been students for a few years, I think maybe four years in the US, they start their residency and they apply, you know, some hospitals want residents, some residents want some hospitals, you have to match them up. So it's a problem of the same type. And before the Gale Shapley algorithm was used, uh, hospital was, hospitals would try to get the best student possible by giving them offers very quickly mm -hmm. and then giving them a very short deadline, mm -hmm. you know, to try to f force their hands. Yes. You know, and at one point the deadline got to something like three hours. Oh man. And then uh, <laughs> like the same day, and then uh, it became intolerable. And uh, that's when uh, the Gale Shapley algorithm was uh, experimented and uh, was a resounding success. And, uh, and already this um, uh, hospital resident matching, so one of the constraints there would be that uh, two young medical students, let's call them Alice and Bob, yes. don't really care so much whether they go to this hospital or that hospital, but they care a lot about going there together. So that's an okay. e example of a very nice constraint. Yes, very nice constraints. Um, constraint, but these residents, they've been studying med medicine for a few years. In our case, these are students who just finished high school. In the French case, yes. In the mm -hmm. French case, so they are uh, younger by several years. So these things don't 
are not so don't come up so they're not so critical, mm -hmm. and we don't um, incorporate these kind of constraints. Mm -hmm. you know, we consider that people who are just finishing high school, they don't yet have uh, form uh, couples that are so strongly uh, bonded to each other that they don't want to go study something unless the other person also goes to the same place. I guess you could argue for something like this with the siblings and other systems. This is, again would not yes. be would not be high school to college, but maybe earlier on that you want. Yes, this, uh, the Gil Shipley algorithm has also been used for um, assigning students to high schools or to middle schools. And there you have family constraints. Families don't want their kids to go to different high schools. So uh, you can incorporate uh, some uh, constraints saying that uh, siblings of the same uh, family unit uh, should go to the same school. So that the parents don't have to drive them all over that's the right. time. That's right. So that seems to be a reasonable constraint. Yes. Uh, whereas we happily ignore the uh, romantic uh, attitudes of young French high schoolers, I guess. <laughs> you know French and romance. Well, well, well. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> um, um, so we'll yeah, let's let, let's get to these to, to these constraints because because that that um, uh, that's an, always a fascinating topic for us to to, to see where the uh, beautiful mathematical model. Uh, meets the harsh brutality of, of reality and then has to be either completely rejected or, if we are in luck, tweaked. And, and, yes. and these decisions can't but um, uh, have an effect on, on, on the result. Yes. So, yeah, so romance and siblings were out, but what, what, con what kind of constraints came up here then? Um, one constraint that came up is um, the constraint of quotas of uh, low-income students or uh, fellowship students. Uh -huh. um, the universities provide rankings, uh, but how do we prevent a risk of, uh, say, a discrimination, voluntary or involuntary, against uh, some uh, less underprivileged populations? Mm -hmm. So to try to prevent this, uh, the French government passed a law uh, saying that there had to be some quotas of uh, low-income students in the rankings. So we had to modify the algorithm to try to provide some kind of a guarantee for the low-income students. So, so, so the law says something like there have to be at least this many or the fraction of students has to be at least the fraction of students from the low-income group, however that is defined. I'm, yes. I'm sure there's a rule for that as well. There's a, a, such a thing as having received a fellowship in high school. That's how we identify low-income students. These are oh, the ones who oh, got a government fellowship um, for low-income oh. students. That's the set, very that would, well that defined. That would be everybody in Denmark, but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I see, okay, so there's a rule that identifies yes. uh, groups that belong to underprivileged group X, yes. here yes. low-income students, yes. and then there's a law that yes. says that every university or that the says total that number of use in every school, for every program, there's an authority, the rector of a region, who will set a certain percentage and will say uh -huh. there's a minimum quota of, say, 25% okay. low-income students. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, fine. So this gives an extra constraint on the, um, on the offers that the university can make? That's right. It's interesting that this, this law, what does it mean exactly? It's a law to try to prevent discrimination. It's to try to prevent the low-income students from uh, not receiving offers um, for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. So the interpretation is, if the quota is, say, 25%, the interpretation is the school should make at least 25% of its offers to low-income students. Oh, as opposed to actually having 25%. Right. Of, uh, I, I understand. The, the difference cannot, is between the outcome and yes. the... Yes. The school cannot guarantee the outcome. The outcome depends on how the students will respond. If all the low-income oh. students answer no thanks, then in September there will be no low-income student in the program. And, and there's nothing the school can do about it. And the so law is not sufficiently precise to spell this out? Or, or yeah, how should it? I it's, guess, yeah. Well, it, it's not the idea. The principle of the law is not, right. we want to make sure that in September we'll yeah, see 25% yeah, yeah. of our students sitting uh, on the bench are low-income students. The okay. principle of the law is the low-income students should have enough of an opportunity. They should 
have the opportunity to go to this program should they want to join? Okay, I, I was thinking too much of it as a computer scientist here. Okay, okay. so the, the law has some kind of a moral ambition of, 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 of what it wants to implement. <laughs> if you will, yes. Mm -hmm. No, no, I guess that makes sense. Yes. Uh, it's, um, a, it's a guarantee on opportunity. It's a guarantee on opportunity. And that's how it's phrased, or is that an interpretation of how it's phrased? I guess, I guess the difference between an, uh, an outcome aim and a um, opportunity aim yes. is... It's a different in spirit. There's a tension between it, these things, you right? You can see it in the discussions. You yeah. know, why should you have a quota? because you want these students to have opportunities. And so the answer is this law that says, you know, at least 25% mm -hmm. of the offers should go to low-income students. That makes sense to me. And because the university can't control who eventually accepts or rejects That's the correct. offers anyway, yes. uh, you can algorithmicize the process of offering these fellowships. That's right over time or in every round or okay. so the way we implement it is we insert an additional step after the university has produced its rankings and before we start this back and forth making offers getting responses and so on in round zero in round zero mm -hmm. on may 21st mm -hmm. we take the ranking given by the university and we modify it to make sure mm -hmm. that in this ranking if you look at the top 12 students, there are at least three low-income students. Mm -hmm. If you look at the top 20 students in that ranking, there are at least five low-income students. If you look at the top 100 students, there are at least 25 low-income students. If for every K, if you look at the top K students, at least K over four are low-income, or else we, we are, we've run out of low-income candidates. Okay, this is a brilliant example of, of <laughs> because once you actually build the code for this, you have to make these decisions of how yes. to interpret the law, yes. because it will end up being a mechanism that actually makes decisions. Yes. And of course, these choices are in some sense transparent. I mean, you can look at the yes. code or... Yes, this is public. The code is public and the algorithm is public. And this was all designed in a dialogue with uh, various uh, lawyers. That was my question, because when you sit there as an algorithm designer, I guess you see, oh, there is an inconsistency here, or, no, oh, this is underspecified. Uh, absolutely and then not. We, we read the law. We thought of a, a rigorous mathematical phrasing of a guarantee mm -hmm. that we mm -hmm. thought corresponded to the law. Mm -hmm. And we talked to uh, lawyers to try to uh, discern with them if the way we wrote was the correct uh, way to translate the law into code. You know. uh, our, our, our responsibility was to translate the law into code and implement, but not to decide what the law is. No, of course. See? So but, that's but why we have to have a dialogue. But you still have to talk to somebody in terms of optimality criteria or linear yes. time. Or yes. How, yes. how did that work? How, so they need us, work? we need them. Yeah. We need them to specify the problem exactly. They need us to make sure that they don't create unreasonable requests, unreasonable law, ask for things that cannot be solved. For example, we don't just have a um, low income quota, we also have local quota. Some universities, some programs are target local students. And uh, that makes sense because building university is a matter of local policies often. That's mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. yeah. And mm -hmm. so some universities might say, in our degree, we want at least 90% local students. And we want at least 25% low-income students. Oh, I can see where this is going. Now, and if you are in the luxurious position of having zero low-income students because you're in a rich part of Paris. Zero low-income students who are local. Yes. yes, yes, because you're in a very rich part of France. Then these two conditions are in tension. What could okay. possibly go wrong? <laughs> <laughs> so if you're a lawyer, you are a politician. Let's say a politician. You think of this quota. Okay, people say, oh yes, let's uh, try to uh, uh, have a quota of low-income students. You think of this other quota, local students. People say, oh yes, of course, we need to have a quota of local students. Yeah. And then here we come, we say, uh, wait, you know, you cannot give us these things. These are, can be not feasible. Mm -hmm. So, and then they, they find a way, you know, to give priority, to prioritize, so as to, uh, so that we, we have a, a problem that is always solvable. As a very cynical 
mathematician, I could still solve this by moving the people around. Right? I could still re redistribute the population of France so that the conflict does not appear. But if, if that's not on the table, I guess you have to. Not on the table this year. Okay. Maybe, <laughs> in, maybe in future years, some parents mm -hmm. will move to try to uh, game the system again. Oh, yes. oh, oh. But, yeah, uh, it's not even funny. Yeah, yeah you're right. You're this but for the this present, yes. uh, this um, is not happening huh. at present. So, and so you see, we nice. need mm -hmm. to talk to um, lawyers and politicians to understand uh, the context of the problem and the conditions and what exactly we need to solve. And they need to talk to us to uh, see that their requests correspond to what we can do. See, They can't just say, this is what we want and now you algorithms people go ahead and do it. You know, that's not how it works. We are uh, algorithms researchers, we know that there are some things we cannot do. There exist impossibility results. Yes. So, um, so uh, that's why uh, we can only create a system that works if we work in a close collaboration. Super fascinating. <laughs> uh, wonderful. This almost included everything I like about this, about this entire field, because there's an algorithmic perspective and it has a, it's a really cute algorithm and it does something and people are affected by it. And there's, this, there's this communication between one discipline and the other, which is really, really hard to do. Yes. And, um, do um, um, you have anything to add? For students in um, algorithms, I guess I would say it's, it would be good if they could always think about the broader context. You know, when, you're, when you study algorithms and you're a student, it's fun, it's exciting, the combinatorics are really um, beautiful. For people like you and me, this is fun and For exciting. For people like you yes. and me. And sometimes you're so uh, excited about the beauty of what you're doing that you forget about the broader context. Mm -hmm. But actually, many of these problems, they did not just happen. You know, they have uh, some reason of being and keeping an awareness of what it's good for in the background helps um, shape the taste that will later educate the research questions that we might want to work on down the line. That was a brilliant closing remark. Uh, Claire, thank you. thank you very much for coming. And thank you. Thank you for listening. Bye.